Uh, good morning. Very nice to see you all. Ah, wrong slide. I was I was pretty excited when I saw so many people coming to see me uh, outside. It turns out they're actually where they're saying. If you're if you're looking for this, apparently it's next door, so it's not here. Um, we're here for real for civic. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Godfrey. You can find me on the internet as Chin Chin Code. And um, so, my God, I have a very exciting announcement to make. Do you see where I'm going with this? Does anyone know what this is? Okay. Well, this is um, Sing Siul. Happy Friday. <laughs> uh, well, so. The other day when I was on my flight here, um, I realized the keynote is going to be on Friday. And um, if you're new to the Ruby community, you might not know this, but there's a, there's a tradition where every Friday, if we're having a conference, we need to do one thing. Um, it's Friday hug. So if you have not done this before, this is what we're going to do. So right now, you're going to stand up, move to the middle, and... Um, you're going to take a selfie. Okay. So stand up, move towards the middle, and raise your arms just like they did in the picture, and we'll get... Ah. This is my first time doing it, so it might take a while, but we'll, we'll, we'll get through this. Okay, are you, are you ready for this? Okay, let's do it. Oh, wait. It's not working. Ah, technology. I guess I have to do this by hand. Okay, there we go. Happy Friday. Um, thank you for doing this with me. Um, unfortunately, that took a little bit longer than I expected because it's my first time doing it. And uh, so I spent all my jokes time on that selfie. And um, so the rest of the talk is going to be very serious. I apologize for that, but there won't be any more jokes in this talk. I'm very sorry. Um, but so anyway, with that out of the way, um, we can get down to serious business. Uh, there is an old Chinese proverb, so translated literally, it means giving a person a fish is not as good as giving, uh, teaching a person to fish. Or if you prefer, there's a more poetic version. Um, give a person a fish and you feed them for a day. Teach a person to fish and you feed them for a lifetime. Um, let's take a moment and appreciate the beauty of the Chinese language here since we're on Taipei. This proverb is written in um, the form of a parallel comparative structure. Something is not as good as something else, right? So, if you pay, if you if you look closely, um, you realize the only difference in the two um, clauses is the last character. Um, the former is a noun meaning a fish, and the latter is a verb meaning to fish or the skill of fishing. What's interesting here is that these two characters are homophonic, um, meaning that they have exactly the same pronunciation. So there's actually a uh, poetic inside joke here. If you haven't seen this in its written form before, you literally cannot understand it just by listening to the words. It, it's not going to make any sense. Um, What's equally interesting is that um, if you look at the first character of the two clauses, they're exactly the same. But 
even though they're exactly the same character, um, used in the first clause, the character means to give, but used in the second clause, it means to teach. Um, this character also has other meanings like to grant or to gift. And it's no coincidence that they all share the same character. Um, teaching is ultimately giving out a gift in the form of a skill. And the best thing a teacher could teach is the meta skill of self-learning, um, which is a gift that would feed a person's intellect for a lifetime. All of these are pretty uncontroversial. If you talk to uh, any teacher or educator, um, I think everyone would agree that that's ultimately what they're trying to accomplish. However, our 21st century economy makes things pretty difficult. Turns out most of us are not farmers or fishermen anymore. So in today's economy, what is the fish and what is the skill of teaching? What does it actually mean to teach someone to fish? In tech, the line is even more blurry. Um, let's say if we teach someone to build a Rails app today, is that teaching them a skill or is that just giving out uh, giving out a fish that would perish in a few years. What about teaching programming? Many cities have announced plans to um, bring programming into the regular school curriculums. Does that count as teaching the skill of fishing? Or um, in our industry, what does it really mean to learn to fish? You have probably heard this before. Um, it goes like this, a job as a programmer or as a software engineer is to solve problems. In other words, um, the fishing skill we want to teach in our industry is called problem solving skills. Well, this is a pretty noble goal. Um, it's not particularly helpful here because it's so big. As far as I can tell, this description is so vague that it basically applies to um, every, pretty much every discipline in today's economy. For example, um, when your client with too much money walks into your office. Um, your job as a financial advisor is to help them figure out the right investment strategy that would maximize their wealth for them. So sadly, this is not a problem I personally have, but that definitely sounds like problem solving to me. So while I would love to think of myself as a magic, magical problem solving oracle, um, that is not really helping us here. Our industry is kind of in love with the idea of disruption lately. Um, startups like Uber and Airbnb have identified some inefficiencies in existing markets and industries. Um, so they came up with a fresh approach involving technology, um, ignored all the rules along the way, and basically changed the game entirely for the industries. For the most part, it's a change for the better. As a consumer, I love the products. Um, when I arrived here at the airport the other day, I took an Uber right to my hotel. Um, later this week, I will be traveling along, around Taiwan, um, staying in a few Airbnb places along the way. Unfortunately, while there are plenty of rules that are just creating friction and inefficiency in the market, there are also plenty of rules that existed for very good reasons and very important ones. As a society, we have encoded decades of learning into these regulations and throwing all of them out and starting over again, meaning we have to relearn all of those lessons painfully along the way. Let's take the taxi industry for, as an example. Many cities have accessibility requirements to ensure people traveling in a wheelchair can reliably hitch a ride. Likewise, the hotel industry have important zoning, fire code, and insurance requirements to ensure everyone's safety. In tech education, we have a similar phenomenon. There are some clear inefficiencies in our computer science education system. Programmers and software engineers are in very high demand these days, as you might know. Um, we need a lot of them, and we want them right now. A computer science degree takes four years in most schools, and that's way too long and that costs too much money. Besides, CS programs don't even produce that many good programmers. Academia is pretty out of touch with the industry and what they teach in school these days are not that useful in the real world. Um, a lot of CS graduates doesn't even have the right skill to, to fill the, the jobs that are actually in demand on the market. So what do we do? Well, 
we disrupt the education system, of course. We came up with these new programs called code schools and boot camps, um, training new entrants on exactly what we need in the industry right now in the shortest amount of time possible. Just like Uber and Airbnb, um, I actually love that idea. And my company, we recently hired a new employee who came from a code school background and she's an excellent fit for the role we were hiring, hiring and um, we couldn't be happy with the result. Um, yet, just like Uber and Airbnb, I can't help but feel that we might be throwing out the baby with the bathwater here. Computer science as an academic discipline have existed for much older than, uh, for much longer than you might think. While the traditional system is far from perfect, Perhaps there are some good reasons on why it's structured the way it is today, and perhaps there are some reasons why the fundamental CS classes have retained more or less the same shape in over a decade. Um, as Rexy mentioned, I came from a traditional CS background myself. I went to a Canadian school called Simon Fraser University for a CS, CS degree, and I also spent some time uh, at National University of Singapore as an exchange student. They both have excellent CS programs, and I'm very grateful for my education there. On the other hand, as a CS graduate, I can definitely understand a lot of the criticisms people have about CS programs. Um, just like most of you, I spent most of my career working on web technology so far. And my day job, perhaps not unlike most of you, involved writing Ruby, Rails, JavaScript, working with the browser, optimizing SQL queries, scaling out servers, and so on. Um, it is indeed true that I didn't learn any of those things from school. I had to learn all of them myself on my own time outside of the regular school curriculum, just like everyone else. Come to think about it, I didn't even learn that much about programming at school. Um, there just weren't that many programming assignments at all, and I was mostly just taught and tested on the conceptual and theoretical level. Two years ago, um, DHH, the creator of Rails, gave a keynote at RailsConf describing our occupation as software writers. That is, a big part of a job is actually to write beautiful code with an emphasis on clarity. By that standard, my CS education was actually pretty terrible. I don't think I was ever once graded on the clarity of my code or even given any kind of feedback on the code quality in my programming assignments. Um, all I needed to do was to submit programs that worked, and that's it. The words refactor and unit test never once came up during my academic career. It's like, not only did they not teach me to fish, all we did was basically sit in a room all day and be like, hmm, given a few ways of catching fishes, how do we prove that one of them is more efficient than the other ways? As it turns out, computer science isn't even really about programming. Um, in fact, it might not have that much to do with computers after all. Dextra, a very famous computer scientist, once said this, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. So perhaps it's not a coincidence that my school chose to name the CS department the School of Computing Science rather than Computer Science. So if CS isn't really about programming and it isn't really about computers and I didn't learn any of the work skills I needed from school, does that mean the critics were right and I basically wasted five years of my time? Well, I can't speak for it. I can't speak for everyone, but personally, I'm actually really glad I did it. I happen to really enjoy learning about the topics they taught at school, and so if nothing else, I had a lot of fun learning about those things. But I think there's probably more to it. Somehow, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be able to work on the stuff I do today without my CS background, and or at least it would have it would have taken me much longer to get here. It's not just about the knowledge either. Um, like most people would tell you, I didn't end up using most of the things I learned at school in my CS program. And even for those things that are actually useful later on, by the time I need them, um, I already forgotten. I have already forgotten most of the details, so I have to 
we learn them anyway. But there is something magical about the experience I went through, something that really changed the way I think and the way I learn, in ways that really helped me later on in my career. Um, I think during my time in school, I might actually have taught myself to fish. Now, I'm not I'm certainly not saying that a four-year CS degree is the only way to acquire this magical skill of fishing. Um, during my career in the industry, I have had the privilege to work with and learn from a lot of smart people who didn't go through um, the traditional CS path. And yet, they have definitely cracked the same nuts. On the other hand, um, this is far from a skill that you automatically pick up just by going through four years of CS program. I've seen plenty of CS graduates that didn't leave the school with these skills and had to struggle a lot when transitioning into industry work. Nevertheless, since my CS education seemed to have helped me develop the magical skill of fishing, maybe I could try to sit down and figure out what exactly it is and which aspects of my CS education helped me to get there. If we can identify this skill, then we can talk about it concretely and Perhaps we could figure out ways to make that easier to pick up for people and try to replicate that in um, code schools even. So that's what this talk is going to be about. And I think I might have an answer for you at the end. But let's come back to that a little bit later. For now, I would like to take you on a slight detour. Um, when I was in school, I also did a minor in cognitive science. For those of you who are not familiar with it, cognitive science is an interdisciplinary study of the human mind. In English, that means a study of how human thinks. Um, sitting at the intersection between computer science and cognitive science is a field called human-computer interaction, also known by other related names like user experience design or user-centered design. The best way to tell you what this field is all about is perhaps to show you about it. Um, at my company, we recently bought a new trash can in the office. It's not just any trash can. It's a smart trash can. It has buttons. It's perhaps a little bit dark, but as you can see, um, there are two physical buttons on the trash can. I don't know if you can see it, but the one on the left has labeled um, close, and the one on the right has a label open. Um, those two buttons, that's pretty much what you would expect. It seems pretty straightforward. But now there's a problem. Sometimes the open button doesn't actually work. Pressing it does nothing. Hmm. Oh well, maybe the trash can is broken. No problem. As you can see, there's an indentation above the buttons that lets you put your finger in there and manually open the lid. <laughs> that works, right? But it kind of defeats the purpose of the smart trash can, don't you think? Well, eventually we realize something odd. There's an LED light in between the two buttons, and sometimes the LED will turn green. And it seems like that whenever this happens, the open button on the trash can will stop working. Well, as it turns out, this smart trash can is very smart. It's um, actually what you might call a state machine. At any given moment, it either thinks the lid is in the open or closed position. Um, naturally, when the lid is open, the only thing you can do is to close it. And when the lid is closed, the only thing you can do is to open it. The problem is the internal state in the trash can can go out of sync with real reality. When someone used the button to open the lid but decide to slam the lid down manually, um, the trash can will incorrectly believe that it's in the open state when the lid is physically closed. In this case, when you try to press the button, it will not do anything useful. It also turns out that the LED is supposed to indicate this internal state. Um, the green LED actually means that it's in the open state, and a blinking red, for whatever reason, means closed. But there's more. Actually, it turns out none of these things actually matter, um, because we shouldn't even be using buttons in the first place. You probably can't see it, but it turns out there's a sensor between the two buttons, 
And what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to walk up to the trash can, wave your hand above it, and it's going to open briefly so you can put your garbage in there, and a few seconds later it will automatically close itself. Now I see why they call it the smart trash can. So surprisingly, even though this example does not involve a computer at all, it basically shows all the important concepts that makes or breaks a good interaction design. Um, I won't get into too much of details here, but if you're interested in learning how to design a better trash can or how to design better user interfaces, I strongly recommend you to read a book from Don Norman called The Design of Everyday Things. What interests me here is the process of how people in the office learn to use this trash can. Um, something Norman calls the human action cycle. It's a loop involving a few steps, goal formation, execution, and evaluation. It turns out when, when you as a human interact with a physical object or, um, or a user interface, the first thing you do is to form a goal. In this case, your goal is you want to throw out the garbage from your lunch into the trash can. So, okay, now you have a goal. The next step is to formulate a plan to achieve your goal and to execute that plan. So in this case, you might think, hmm, I should probably go up to the trash can, press the open button, put my garbage in there, and I'm done. The last step, though, is actually the crucial part, the evaluation step. So what you do here is, after executing your plan, you, you need to observe the result of the plan um, and interpret the outcome. Did it work? Did the result match your expectations? If not, in this case, the lid didn't open. Um, you need to go back to the, step, to the first step um, but this, and start over again, but this time you will feed what you just learned from the previous cycle into the next cycle, um, so you would adjust your goals and your plans accordingly. Perhaps you would try to um, manually open the lid with your finger. So what's happening here is that humans have a mental model of how to interact with physical objects and user interfaces. You start with a pretty simple, uh, pretty fuzzy mental model, but as you go through the human action cycle, um, you will keep learning and keep refining um, your mental model, and eventually you will, even something as bizarre as the smart trash can in our office, eventually you will, you will arrive at the right mental model and you'll be able to use it. What sets a good design apart from a bad design is a good design naturally guides the user to form the correct mental model so while steering away, while steering them away from the incorrect mental models. When a user's mental model doesn't match reality, you will have, you will have some pretty sad users, as you can see in, um, in the case of our trash can. This is sometimes summarized as the usability iceberg. Um, on the top, um, you have the parts that sit above water. Um, in other words, those parts are the visible parts. Visual things like the graphic design, the colors, the typography, um, and perhaps Instagram's new logo makes up about 10% of the overall experience. Um, they're very visible, so people complain about them a lot. But um, at the end of the day, if you take into account of everything, they're only a tiny fraction of the overall experience. Then there is um, the interaction part of the usability iceberg. Um, that includes things like, does the scrolling feel smooth in your app, or does the animation feel smooth, right? So those kind of things make up another 40% of the overall experience. So those are only the visible parts of the iceberg, though. Um, the bulk of the user experience actually comes from the hidden part of the iceberg that sits below the water, the mental model. Um, that includes things like, does the flow of the UI matches the user's expectation? Um, does it perform the functionality that everyone expects? The reason I brought up this um, usability iceberg is that I think there are a lot of similarities between UX and programming. This is perhaps not 
super surprising because after all, programming a computer to do stuff um, by writing code is a form of human-computer interaction. Um, the source code you're typing is, in fact, a user interface. Um, I think the iceberg analogy applies just as well to programming as it applies to UX. On the top of the iceberg, you have visual things like coding style, the use of white spaces and stuff. Underneath that, you have the interaction layer. For example, does your code feel like, um, assuming you're writing Ruby, does it feel like Ruby? Does it follow Ruby conventions? Does it take advantage of language features like blocks and keyword arguments? But more importantly, um, it's the invisible part that sits under water that makes or breaks the experience. The mental model. Does the code flow naturally? Does it do a good job of breaking up different concepts into their own objects or their own methods? Just like it was, just like a well-designed user interface, well-factored code naturally guides the reader into forming the right mental model. Um, having good comments help, but um, things like good naming convention is also very important. Um, having to name things in particular forces you to think more critically about the concept that, that, that is floating around in your code. In fact, the Ruby community have realized this a long time ago. We have this thing called the principle of least surprise, uh, which is really just saying if you lead your users down into forming the wrong mental model, you're going to have some pretty confused and pretty sad users, and they're going to have a bad time understanding um, or using your code. Conventions over configuration is also related to this. Um, by sharing the same conventions, you can build your mental model once and take it with you everywhere even in code bases that you have um, that are completely new to you. So this is particularly true for Rails. If you learn Rails and you get dropped into a new Rails app, you know exactly where to find things. So mental models are closely related to another concept in programming called abstractions. High-level abstractions like Rails are extremely valuable because they allow you to start building from the 50th level instead of starting from the ground up every time. Um, I don't have to sell that to you. You're all here for Rails Pacific, so you all have experienced that. Um, the higher up the stack, usually the higher up the stack, the more value you're bringing to your business and to your end users. So perhaps it's not a coincidence that start evaluations and engineering sal engineer salary are higher than ever before today because we are building on a very high foundation of um, abstractions and we we are we're able to deliver tremendous value right from the get-go so while abstractions are pretty great the ties are turning a little bit against them abstractions are getting a pretty bad rap these days um, that's pretty understandable. A lot of people have been burned by bad abstractions. And when you get burned, the emotions are so vivid, it leads us down to conclusions like, oh, abstractions can never work. Um, they cause you to not understand what you're doing. So the only way, the only way out is to start from the ground up every time. So you, like, you, build, exact, like you build your own tools so you know exactly what is going on. Um, as an industry, we decided to disrupt abstractions by promoting microlibraries, building your own framework, and assembling your own tools. There is um, actually a terse way to say this. Joel Spolsky, who coined the term leaky abstraction, said this in his essay. While these great tools like more than all form-based languages let us get a lot of work done incredibly quickly, Suddenly, one day, we need to figure out a problem where the abstraction leaked, and it takes two weeks. So, all abstraction leak, so we should stop using them, right? Well, in my opinion, while all abstractions leak is a correct observation, um, the way it is being cited these days is really missing the point. In science and in statistics, we have a similar banner slogan, all models are wrong. But this is not the end of it. The key insight actually comes after this. All models are wrong, but some are useful. Let's talk about physics for a second. If you study physics in high school, 
um, you were probably taught to ignore the effect of friction and air resistance in your calculation. Now, this is obviously the wrong model. In the real world, obviously, there are friction and resistance forces. Um, but this is far from a useless model. It's a wrong model, yes, but it's not useless. It allows you, as a high school student, to form a good enough mental model to start understanding the world and make certain uh, limited predictions about the world that we live in. Now, this is not just a toy model that we we built for high schoolers. It exists as a it, it exists at a wider scale. For example, um, the new the Newtonian mechanics or the classical mechanics that you learn from high school physics is technically wrong, but it's good enough for a lot of purposes, right? However, if that model starts to break down on you, you can always drop down to a low level of, of explanation, things like thermodynamics, quantum mechanics, and like perhaps relativity. Now, the fact that Newtonian mechanics is a leaky model doesn't mean it's a useless model in practice. Just because relativity is a better approximation of reality, it doesn't mean you want to think about um, designing a car in terms of the space-time fabric. So scientists are explicitly taught to build models, even though everyone knows that all models are wrong. In fact, these models is, um, the fact that these models are a simplification is actually a feature, not a bug. The world we live in is too complicated, and having these simplified models give us the ability to understand anything at all. And it also gives us the ability to make some good enough predictions like your weather forecast. So, in my opinion, abstractions serve a pretty similar purpose in our field. Since abstractions exist to help guide your users and readers to form the right mental model, all abstractions leak is merely pointing out the true but uninteresting fact that all mental models are wrong. Just like all models are wrong, all mental models are wrong, but some are useful, and so is abstraction. All abstractions leak, but some are useful. In cognitive science, we have a magic number of the, we have a rule of magic number seven. That is, a human can only keep around roughly seven distinct objects in your working memory at the same time. And some people do a little bit better, some people do worse when you're sleep deprived like me right now. You usually do a little bit worse, but that's a good enough abstraction for our purpose. Since seven is such a low number, um, you really need to make very good, you need to take good advantage of um, your very limited cognitive, cap, uh, cognitive capacity. Abstractions is a pretty good hack that allows you to group things up into higher level objects so you can keep more of them in your mind at the same time. Abstractions help you form a simplified mental model by hiding away the unimportant details that um, you shouldn't be concerned right at this moment. Of course, unimportant is highly contextual. So, for example, if you are designing a car and you decide to ignore the effect of friction, you're going to have a pretty bad time in the real world. Good abstractions help you establish clear boundaries. It helps you put complicated things into their own mental black boxes and so you can stop worrying, stop worrying about them too much for the most part. But as we said, all abstractions leak. So what do you do when the abstractions inadvertently leaks. Well, what happens if the abstractions stop behaving the way you expect? Well, turns out we all know the answer to that. That's called debugging. That's just, as developers, that's part of what we do every day. Of course, um, one way to fix that problem is to just throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Basically, just keep trying to change your code until something works. We we all do that from time to time, I, I do it, and I wouldn't judge if you do it too, but um, that should feel deeply unsettling to you. Um, at work, I pair with my colleague Yehude Katz a lot, whom you might know from his work on Rails and Ember, um, and when we're pair debugging, a phrase that you hear a lot from our office is, I have no mental model of how anything works anymore. And the reason that is true is 
when, um, when we're working on big code bases like Rails and Ember, since we can only keep seven things in our head at once, we have to lean very hard on um, our abstractions and mental models. In this case, one of the mental objects that takes up the slot might be um, the router or the view layer. When you, when you cast a nest so wide, obviously it's going to be a very leaky abstraction, but that's okay. Without these kind of abstractions or these kind of simplifications, we would not have the ability to work on big things at all. And even though you might not be working on Ember or Rails, um, unless your job is to write micro libraries like left pad all day, um, this will probably bear some resemblance to your development workflow too. And so since we lean so heavily on mental models, um, we are leaning very hard on them being correct. Um, and as a result, if they, if they don't match reality, any of the assumptions we have made along the way could be wrong, and that could jeopardize a whole day of work, and worse, it might, it might um, even jeopardize our future ability to keep working on the code base. Therefore, when we notice a uh, when we notice that our mental model seems to be drifting away from reality, we usually treat it as, a, it as an emergency that requires immediate attention. Now, when that happens, it's not necessarily your fault. Sometimes this is indeed caused by misconception in our head, but other times it might actually just be a bug in the abstraction layer below. Either way, we need to figure out the source of the bug and either patch the code or fix our own mental model. If you're lucky, sometimes this all it takes is basically just to um, carefully reread the documentation. In an ideal world, um, abstract the abstractions we work with will naturally guide us along the right path and towards the right men mental model. But in the real world, bad designs like the trash can we saw earlier are everywhere and you can't always fix them all. Having the ability to notice that um, some designs are bad allows you to build an accurate, um, it, or at least gives you the ability to try to build a more accurate mental model despite the deficiencies in the abstraction, and which gives you the, the ability to work around or work with these poor designs. So that's for um, on a good day. All you need to do is just read the documentation again and realize you're doing something stupid and fix your code. But a lot of the time, it's not so simple. Um, a lot of the time, the only way to figure out what actually went wrong is to dig into the abstraction layer you're sitting on. Joe, who con again coined the term leaky abstractions, wrote this in his essay. When you need to hire a programmer to do mostly visual basic programming, it's not good enough to hire just a visual basic programmer because they will get stuck in tar every time the visual basic abstraction leaks. And I think that probably um, matches the experience with um, Rails or other kind of abstractions that you're working with on a day to day basis as well. Sometimes you just have to know what's your. Um, Sometimes the abstraction just leads enough that you have to actually understand the details that is trying to abstract away from you in order to fix the problem. So traditional computer science education tried to solve this problem by um, using a bottom-up approach. In most CS curriculums, you usually start from the bottommost layer and learn your way all the way up the stack of abstractions. For example, in your first year, you would probably do a mix of programming, computer architecture, discrete math, and calculus. Um, once you have these foundations in place, you can move up to things like data structure, algorithms, statistics, and um, maybe linear algebra for your second year. Then in your third year, you may learn about operating systems, databases, um, artificial intelligence, and computer graphics. And then finally, in your fourth year, you can take all of these knowledge that you've learned, apply them to things like networking, um, information systems, computer vision, and maybe computer animation. Supposedly, the nice thing about the system is that even though you rarely have to go so deep to the, all the way to the bottom of this, the abstraction stack, um, because you have learned all the way up one layer at a time, um, when something goes wrong, you always have the ability to dig into 
the lower layers should you need to. There's a problem though. Um, since there are so many different topics to learn, um, I'm only showing four columns here, but there are many, many, many more columns. Um, you don't really have time to build that high in your four years in school. Since everyone in the real world actually builds from the 50 floor, um, learning up to the 20 floor in school seems like a laughably short stack. Supposedly, oh, let's, say, let's suppose you actually want to build a JavaScript app in the browser. Well, your CS education stopped in um, the information system level. And so what do you do? You have to somehow figure out the stuff in between and then you learn the 50th level Rails and Ember and so on. Or suppose you want to build a game um, but your CS education stopped, as, stopped at the theory behind computer animations. What do you do? So, since we're so used to building up um, in baby steps in school, jumping from the 20th floor to the 50th floor, it's a very big jump for a lot of people, and many of them fall falls off the CS cliff and fail to um, or struggle to connect the dots between their education and their industry work. Code schools, on the other hand, realize a thing. Um, it turns out that we, as an industry, are pretty good with building abstractions these days. And when you're working with something like Rails, it's very rare that you have to dig all the way down to the operating system level to figure out what's going on. So perhaps we can just start from the 50th level and teach all the way up instead of going all the way down to computer architecture since you don't need them most of the time anyway. Um, so this actually has the opposite problem. What happens if you do need to go down, not maybe not all the way to the operating systems level, but what if you just need to go down one level underneath Rails. Um, hopefully you'll eventually learn them somehow. Maybe your job will teach you. Now, the CS cliff is real, but, so the CS cliff is real and the code school observation is indeed correct. Most of the time you don't need to go down those layers, but neither of those are perfect or sufficient. What you actually need is the ability to pop, in, pop up and down the stack and not be intimidated by going down one more level underneath you. Lazy learning, just like as in lazy loading is fine. You can learn, um, you can learn things on demand as you need them. But again, you need to not be intimidated to do that and have a good framework for learning things on demand. I would argue that this is actually the meta skill of fishing in our industry. The con specifically the ability to um, think abstractly and operate at the mental model level and also the ability to learn new things um, on demand and not be intimidated by going down one more level. Um, more generally, the ability to operate on mental models, the ability to acknowledge that these, these mental models exist, um, the, the ability to acknowledge that they are a simplification, they're not perfect, they, are, they will leak, but knowing what to, what to do when they do leak is a very important skill to have in our industry. Now the structure of the traditional CS education um, system happened to happen to help me learn those skills along the way, but it's far from guaranteed. The way, the way that these skills are taught in the traditional path is more or less incidentally embedded in the structure of the program. Um, hopefully, if you, if you um, build one layer up every time and you do it four years in a row, hopefully you realize that these layers exist and you will be confident about your ability to keep learning up because you will you realize ah things might be pretty 
things might look di- pretty difficult from the outside, but I can do it. I can, um, I can learn about these things. But that's, that's not very explicit, right? Like, that's basically leaving it up to um, the students to connect the dots themselves. Maybe we can, um, maybe there's something we can do uh, about that to make that more, to make that structure more explicit. Maybe we can do better about giving out mental roadmaps to, um, giving our students mental roadmaps um, to all the layers without getting into details. Um, it's good to know that they exist, even for, uh, as a code school student, it's good to know what's you're sitting, the, what is the abstraction stack that you're sitting on, even though you might not have time to get into all the details. And we are not done here, right? Regardless of whether you came from a traditional CS background or a code school background, there's always more to learn. Um, in CS, you have to learn the stuff between the 20th floor and the 50th floor um, yourself. And when you get out to the industry, as a code school graduate, you might need to learn down the stack as you encounter problems. So regardless of where you came from, you actually need the skill to do this in the real world anyway. And um, that brings us back to the human interaction cycle. You basically have to keep refining your mental model as you encounter, as you learn. So if you, you, you can start with a pretty fussy mental model of, well, this is Rails, it does magic for me. But as soon as that doesn't work, you have to evaluate that, ah, something about my mental model, about this piece is not correct. Let me dive one level deeper to figure out what's, what's wrong. There is a more generic version of the um, human action cycle in the academia. It's called the hermeneutic circle. Um, this is originally used to describe how Bible scholars study the Bible. Um, basically, the idea is to understand the full text. You must understand um, both. Um, the way to understand the full text is to understand the individual parts of the text. And the only way to understand the individual parts of the text is to understand the whole thing. So it sounds circular, which is why it's a circle. But the idea is you have to take into account all of the things as you try to understand something. Um, you need to start with the big picture, um, perhaps the history, the culture of the um, the background of the text you're trying to read, and you need to have a holistic view of the text, and then you can zoom in on the individual parts. But then you're not done. You have to loop back to the big picture and keep going. As you go through the circle, you'll refine your understanding of the concepts. So in um, the traditional CS education, we have a very, very big hermeneutic circle. Um, the whole circle takes four years which is way too long for many people. When you get to the end of the circle, um, you probably forgot why you're here in the first place anymore. Cold school have the opposite problem. Three months crash course, um, you, you take a three months cr- crash course and then you go to work. But the problem is how do you go back into the loop and keep learning? We have um, more resources today than ever before. Yet we have like things like iTunes View, OpenCourseWare, Coursera, you have, blo- you have book clubs, you have meetups, we have um, paper clubs, but that requires a lot of motivation and dedication and determination. Maybe, um, and also as a, nova- as a novice, how do you know what to learn next? Right. Um, perhaps we can structure our programs a little bit better to help people get through that cycle. So I... I'm running a little bit low on time, so I'll skip to the end for you. Um, there is a saying called, it takes a village, it takes an entire village to raise a child. In my experience, that's definitely true. Um, my CS education didn't end at SFU. Um, like I mentioned, I, I was in the co-op program in my school, so I had to do an internship every summer. and. Especially during my first year, um, whoever hired me to do that job took a uh, very big risk and um, 
on, on hiring me. Like, what do I know as a first year student, right? And a lot of people along the way have made the same kind of um, investment on me, and I probably wouldn't be here without those trusts and those risk takers and those investments. Um, I was fortunate enough to get the RailsConf Opportunity Scholarship um, five years ago in RailsConf, Texas, and um, that's where I met a lot of my open source mentors and who invested time in me and helped me level up. And likewise, there are a lot of other people who took risk and invested in me. But that's not the end either. My CS education didn't start at SFU. I actually cheated. I taught myself programming since high school. But so when I go to um, most of my CS classes, it's already my second or third pass through the human the hermeneutic circle. This started when I met my first mentor, my computer teacher in my elementary school, who spent time outside of school hours to teach us to build websites. And he also handed me my first programming book called Professional PHP, which is what I used to taught myself programming. But that's not the begin that's not the beginning either. I my um, CS education actually started when I decided to delete all my system files on the computer out of curiosity and my uncle had to come fix my computer for me and show me how to reinstall Windows. But that's not all either. I probably wouldn't be able to do any of these without um, support from my family who tells me it's okay to explore my interest in a culture where getting top grades from school is the beginning and end of everything. I probably wouldn't be able to um, do any of these things if I give in and let the if I gave in and let the weight of the education system deprive me of my free time, and um, I probably wouldn't be able to do any of these if I would get bullied at school for being a geek, and I certainly wouldn't be here if I keep hearing people tell me that I shouldn't be doing this just because I'm a girl. Um, Computer science education is not just about teaching abstractions or programming literacy. It's also about standing up against bullying, um, gender equity, and also reforming our edu education system to support kids to develop the interests. If it takes a village to raise a child, it certainly takes an entire fishing village to raise a 21st century digital fisherman. So you are all here, <coughs> and you have all made it. Um, but we need more fishermen, and you all have something to give. So I will close with this. Please pay it forward. Be the village. Thank you very much.